Today, I had the privilege of talking to Christian Wagner. He runs a fantastic blog called Apologia Anglicana, and there is a link in the description below that takes you there, and I highly recommend you check it out. Now, the topic of our conversation was transubstantiation and how Anglicans should respond to it. Christian and I both agree that Anglicans who are faithful to the formularies cannot accept transubstantiation. We talk about why that is, and Christian also gave a theological critique of transubstantiation as well. Now, the occasion that led to this conversation was that last week I made a video called Why Anglicans Reject Transubstantiation. And in that video, I presented a more popular view of transubstantiation, where it is held that Christ is physically present in the Eucharist. Many Roman Catholics have that view, and the formularies sometimes seem to be attacking that kind of understanding. But what Christian did is he wrote an article on his blog that said, actually, that presentation of transubstantiation isn't faithful to the more scholastic view held by people like St. Thomas Aquinas. So in this video, what Christian does is he presents that scholastic view, and that's what we are talking about in the video. So I hope that you will enjoy this video, that you'll learn something from it, and thank you for watching. Hello, Christian. How's it going? It's going good. How's it going with you? Yeah, it's going good. So yeah, thank you for coming on to my channel. Um, it's great to talk to you. I'm a really big fan of your um, blog as well. Been, I actually have it saved on the um, homepage of my phone, believe it or not. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's great. I really appreciate what you're doing there. So um, it's great to talk to you. And maybe just before we begin, we'll, we'll say a prayer. We'll do the Lord's Prayer together with the 1662 language. All right. So I'll just say, first of all, why I think this conversation uh, is an important one to have. Um, because a lot of people would would think that it's just unnecessary. Why are we talking about this? It sort of seems like we're splitting hairs. What does it even matter? What's going on in the Eucharist? It, it, all that matters is that we take it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it's up to you what you believe in your head. I'd say... First of all, it's important because when we're talking about the Eucharist, we're talking about Jesus Christ. And I think it's fair enough and reasonable that as people who love Jesus, we want to know how exactly he's present in this sacrament. And if, if you think, as I do, that the Eucharist is sort of the way that we um, relate to Jesus and experience Jesus in the clearest way in our lives, um, excluding sort of apparitions or sort of visions we could have or that sort of thing. It's, I think it's important for us to sort of know how exactly he's present. Are we physically receiving him? Are we not physically receiving him? Is it, is he there at all? So yeah. it's just sort of like a pious interest, but then also what we believe about the Eucharist shapes our actions. So if Christ is physically present in the Eucharist, for instance, then it would be appropriate to worship the elements, to do Eucharistic yep. adoration. And if he was sort of physically present and you weren't adoring the Eucharist, that would actually be a problem because you should be worshiping Christ if he's there. On the flip side, if you believe in like a Zwinglian memorialist position, worshiping the Eucharist would be idolatry and that would yep. be a, a serious, serious problem. So I think it's important to figure out the intricacies of it for that reason to, you know, affect how we relate to the Eucharist. And then I'd say the final reason would just be the liturgy. So as liturgical worshipers, I think it's important for us to have a liturgy that is accurately describing what's happening in the Eucharist. And again, that's why this is an important conversation to have. It's about should our liturgy change? Is it, is it good the way it is, et cetera? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there anything you'd add to that or do you think that's... Yeah, it's just um, in all of the early catechisms of the church and in all the Reformation era catechisms of the church, that was something which was focused upon is you had the Lord's Prayer, you had the Apostles' Creed, you had the Ten Commandments, and then they cover the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And that's how catechism was done, is that was just something completely central to being initiated into the church. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So that's another reason it's important to know. 
Okay, well, with that out of the way then, let's get into this conversation about transubstantiation. So how about we start with maybe you giving a robust but somewhat brief description of what transubstantiation really uh, is. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. Uh, just make sure you um, let me know if I'm being a little too abstract here sure, or if you have yeah. any questions because this this tends to get a little bit um, difficult to understand. It took me a while to uh, understand what was what was actually happening. Sure, so, and let's just say that the, the I think the interpretation you're giving or the description you're giving of transubstantiation is the more scholastic sort of Thomas Aquinas yeah. description of it. Rather than yeah, the popular it's, it's view, be, which is what I was sort of doing in my video, that sort of more popular level understanding, yeah. which isn't quite obviously what Aquinas um, was was getting at. So, yeah, it's kind yeah. of like if you asked an Anglican layperson about, uh, I don't know, the Trinity versus you asked uh, Lancelot Andrews about the Trinity. It's going to be two very different answers that you're going to get, and one of yeah. them might be heretical. Sure, and it's that's not right. Lancelot Andrews, that's going to be <laughs> saying that. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so what, what you have first is you have the matter, form, intention, and minister mm -hmm. of a sacrament. So the matter is going to be the bread and the wine. The form is going to be the word spoken. Mm -hmm. The minister is obviously the priest. You need a priest or a bishop in order to consecrate a Eucharist. And the intention is that it becomes the body and blood of Christ. So when you have a priest who speaks, this is my body, and this is the chalice of my blood, over the Eucharistic elements, they change into the body and blood of Christ. They're identified with that. And this transformation, it's what happens is you have bread, and you have the appearances of bread, like the they're called accents. Like if you have this book, the Anglican office book, it's a really good book. Yeah, you should really get it. So it's it's red. It's got these gilded pages. It's got these strings. It's next to my head. Those are the different attributes of it. If it changes and goes in front of me, or if I spill some coffee on it, it is still a book. Mm -hmm. But the appearance of this book has changed. So the substance is that unchangeable part of it. What makes it it? And the accidents are those changeable parts of it. So in the transformation of the Holy Eucharist, uh, in transubstantiation, what you have is you have the appearances, the physical elements of bread and wine. So it's spatial location, it's uh, physical nature, it's appearances, it's taste, it's smell, uh, the fact that it, after you eat it, you're not hungry. All those facts of the Eucharist, I mean, of the, uh, the bread, stay the same. But the isness of it, what it's predicated as, uh, that changes in the in the transformation. So what you have is the species or appearance of bread and wine, and under that species of bread and wine, under that appearance of bread and wine, you have the true body and blood of Christ. Right. Yeah. So is it is it fair to say that because the substance of the bre of bread and wine um, is sort of transformed into the substance of Christ's body and blood in a sense that substance has been destroyed or removed? No, no, no. Um, so Aquinas talks about this in his sentences, in the comment, uh, commentary on the sentences, and he also talks about this uh, in his Summa Theologica, that what happens is, so in order for something to move from one place to another place, it can be done in two ways. So either it could be locally moved, like if I pick up my pen here and transfer it here, mm -hmm. or there could be a substantial change that happens. So let's say the air here substantially changes into my pen in an obviously miraculous way. So now with the substance of the bread, uh, it is transformed. It isn't destroyed and replaced. It isn't removed. And then there's a local change. What happens is it's transformed. So it's, it's truly a miraculous event where the substance of bread and the substance of wine are, are transformed. It doesn't go away. Okay. It just changes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so is that, that's basically how, how that's your definition then? 
No, it, it gets it gets a little more complicated. Uh, okay. So when because now we get get into areas such as uh, the because I know you one one of the arguments that you had on your other video is the one that's made against uh, the Lutheran view of the Eucharist because mm-hmm. the Lutherans believe in something called ubiquity. So mm-hmm. in the, all the communicatio idiomatum, so the communication of idioms, where we describe the uh, where where we say that Jesus Christ is God and is man, they have it to where there's a a mixing going on mm-hmm. to where ubiquity or omnipresence is predicated to the human nature of Christ. Therefore, the uh, the Eucharistic uh, corporeal presence can happen in the Eucharist, but uh, that does not happen with the uh, Roman Catholic view of the Eucharist because they don't believe in a, in a local presence like you would get in a Lutheran view or a corporeal presence. They believe in a substantial presence. So this differs. Uh, I, I think Thomas Aquinas, I remember he describes it like if you had a fireplace and you would say the substance uh, theoretically speaking, the substance of that fireplace is going to be the fire in mm-hmm. the fireplace. That fireplace is locally right here. Mm-hmm. And then you have another house over here and you spark a fire in here, or you take the fire from here and put it in there. The locality of the fireplace is still right here, but the substance of that fireplace is now substantially present in a different place. Right. So the local presence of Christ is still on the right hand of God, the father almighty, Mm -hmm. but the substantial presence of Christ can be in multiple places at once. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the dimens, what's called the uh, dimensive qualities, the dimensive quantity of Christ or his locality his dimensions that, that is still locally present at the right hand of God. So that, that's why uh, I, I discourage if, if somebody wants to debate me on this, I, I don't mind this isn't a hill to die on, but I, I discourage using the argument from uh, the local presence of Christ because even in their affirmations, they don't affirm a local presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but a substantial presence. Sure. Okay. Another important concept to understand and a, a pretty complicated concept. This will only take a few minutes, but uh, the inherence of the accidents. So if we if we go back to my Anglican office book, mm-hmm. the uh, there the accidents of this of this sub of this thing, the accidents of this thing in here in a substance. So what you can't have is you can't just have the appearances of something floating without it being something, right? Mm-hmm. You can't just have the appearance of of book without a book. Yeah, but the uh, But actually, in transubstantiation, you do have the appearances of bread and wine without any adherence. So Christ, his his substance does not take upon itself the attributes of bread and wine. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's it's the idea of of Christ's substance hiding underneath the uh, accidents of bread and wine, which which kind of sounds a bit a bit crazy when when you think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh. The, the way that it's explained is, in essence, that it's a miracle. So you can have the uh, the effect of adherence without the cause of substance if you have divine power, which has the effect without having the normal cause of a substance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I think I think that I think that about that about. Wait. Wait. So you have um one one last. I promise is the last thing. And describing transubstantiation, you'll you'll get it after this one. So, so a lot of a lot of people object. Well, if you just have this substantial presence, mm-hmm. how so that's not really Christ in the Eucharist, because you, you just have you're saying you have a hyper literal literalistic reading of this is my body, but really it's this is the substance of my body and the accidents of bread and wine. That 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 could be leveled against them, but. In order to answer this claim, they have an idea called concomitance. Mm -hmm. So concomitance means coming with. So with the substance of the, by the power of the sacrament, you only have the substance of bread and wine. But what naturally comes with or is of concomitance is also the things like the dimensive 
quantity, the uh, the um, the body, blood, soul, and divinity, all of those things which aren't necessarily the substance of body, substance of blood, come along with it in that you participate in it through the sort of like an instrumentality, like in, in the language of the reform view. You participated in it or it's present in the elements themselves? It's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Okay. It, uh, it just naturally comes with whereby you receive it. So you wouldn't say that those things are present locally. You would say they're present by concomitants and in the substance you receive them. Okay. I, I'm a little confused about how this doesn't separate Christ out. So you, you mentioned this analogy of uh, the fireplace, but mm-hmm. of course a fire is quite different to a human being who's a, who's a, yep. a living being. So mm-hmm. you could say as an analogy, um, you could cut off my finger and put it on the other side of the room. And now I'm in two places. Um, but yeah. my finger's dead though. It's not part of my life force. And it's certainly not part of my soul. So you wouldn't say my soul is in my finger over there. But yeah. if we're saying that Christ is present in his soul as well in all these Eucharistic elements around the world, I, 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 I'm struggling how that's not dividing him. Or, well, is, it's it, not- or is there a more reformed view? I mean, you know, is it similar to the reformed view where we're actually sort of participating up into the heavenly realm? where his soul is or yeah i've actually i've actually been uh i've been thinking and talking to people about that i'm not really not really prepared to compare the whole reformed and catholic how concomitants could relate to instrumentality in the mm-hmm. in, uh, virtualism in, in in the in the reform view but when it comes to the substance of something we kind we kind of need to get our brains out of like the physicalness realm mm-hmm. because because to say something is substantially present is to not say that it's like it's here and it's it's to say that it's this and, okay. and that's really it's it's really difficult uh some our, our language kind of stops here and I, I don't think i could go really any further than to just hmm. say that it's not locally present it's substantially present it, it is this it's not necessarily here sure okay i understand okay well thank christ you for is, that description there but christ is up there when you're talking about his location mm-hmm. but he is this when it comes to the substance. Okay, cool. Well, let's get into the Anglican response to that then. So I think what we'll do is we'll start off with the formularies and what they say. So I've got here in this um, international version of the prayer book, which has the articles. This is what article 28 of the um, articles say, 39 articles. Transubstantiation or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner, and the means whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. So, and then there's a, there's a final sentence as well, which sort of refutes various Roman Catholic adoration practices as well. Yeah. So it says the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. So what, do you want to just unpack that a little bit? Because um, it's, it's, it's all quite sort of simple, essentially. It says it's it overthrew the nature of the sacrament. It doesn't exactly say how that is. Do you want to just unpack yeah. that and explain yeah what's going on in this article um, about transubstantiation. Yeah, so um, in in the classical Augustinian tradition of what a sacrament is, you have that, uh, you have an element, and then you have a spiritual grace. So the reason that such authors as Peter Martyr Vermigli, uh, before the articles articles were written, he had a great influence on the Book of Common Prayer and on Cranmer's theology, and eventually on the, the theology of the articles. So they, they go back to Augustine and say, hey, look, there's this element that you need, and then there's the spiritual grace that you need. So you have the spiritual grace with the, the substance of Christ, but mm-hmm. you don't have the element. You don't have that, that thing that, uh, that becomes the instrument of that spiritual grace because you have the destruction 
or the transformation of the substance of the bread and wine. So the element is taken away and destroyed. And you see that in the rest of this uh, of this article when it talks about the reason the reason behind it being wrong. So essentially the distinction between the outward element and the sort of inward or spiritual grace is blurred and sort of then there no longer is a distinction. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. What it's saying is that there's it, it becomes the thing itself and not necessarily uh, an in, a physical instrument of spiritual mm-hmm. grace. It just becomes, I guess you could say, pure spiritual grace. Yeah. So, it, so it's at, at that point, it's no longer a sacrament. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. That that's that's what they're that's what they're saying because of how uh, Augustine in the tradition generally has defined a sacrament. But I mean, a Roman Catholic could respond to this argument. Well, we have the dimensive quality and the accidents of the bread and the wine. Therefore, we have that element. But an Anglican holding the articles cannot argue that way because then they would say the articles are wrong. And if the articles are wrong, then we've got a problem. We do have um, a problem. Uh, we'll get to that in, in just a sec, actually, about about the Anglican response to the articles themselves. But also then the next part is it says that the body of Christ is given, taken, eaten, received only in a heavenly and spiritual manner. So do you think that that can respond to transubstantiation as well? Or at that point in the article, are we sort of moving away from talking about transubstantiation? Yeah, I think... Because that's a that's definitely a difficult one of mm-hmm. what that exactly means. Uh, there was recently some uh, a series of articles on North American Anglican that looked at okay when we look at Anglican Anglican Eucharistology, what exactly does it mean? Who is it excluding? Who is it including? And they made a good case on the I think it was I think it was Jeffries that were the series articles, but he made a very good case that it accepted some sort of substantial presence in the Eucharist. So the question of what, what heavenly and spiritual means is, could it mean heavenly and spiritual after the manner of a substance Mm -hmm. or heavenly and spiritual after the manner of an instrument? The, I don't think the articles are clear and considering the fact that some of the original authors of the articles and uh, John Whitgift, I, th- I think it was, um, supported a more substantial view of the Eucharist. Then I don't, I don't think that necessarily goes against the substantial presence. I think the much better case is to look at uh, whether it supports the presence of the substance of the bread and wine, which it clearly goes against anyone who is going to say that the substance of the bread and wine aren't absent. And that was really the the argument during the Reformation. It wasn't over, is Christ present or not? We all agree that Christ is present. Yeah, the question absolutely. is, is the bread and wine present or not? Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I've argued before that the heavenly and spiritual manner is a more reformed idea about us yeah. being exalted into heaven and receiving Christ from there. Okay, and then, of course, the article continues and it, it talks about how we can't worship the sacrament as well. Now in transubstantiation, there would be no issue with worshiping the yeah. Eucharist. Yeah, that's um, a, in, in, within Roman Catholicism, uh, Eucharistic adoration is, a, is strictly a Western practice. Mm-hmm. Even uh, the Eastern Catholic churches don't practice Eucharistic adoration. And what's interesting is Thomas himself uses that as an argument for the, uh, the absence of the substance of bread and wine. He said, the bread and wine cannot be present in substance or we will be committing idolatry. So that's that's an interesting point to think about, especially in relation to this article. Now, if Anglicans do believe that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, like the catechism says, you know, we verily and indeed receive the body of Christ. Why is it a problem in our opinion, to worship the sacrament? Or well, is it not a problem? Well, some, some Anglicans will, uh, will say that it isn't. And I'm, I'm, still, I'm still reading through this issue. But the main uh, gripe of the Reformers with this issue is that when Christ instituted the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, 
his purpose and institution was to receive. Mm -hmm. And that's the same argument that Eastern Catholics and Eastern Orthodox will make is he instituted the sacrament for us to eat it, for us to receive him through uh, bread and wine. He didn't institute the sacrament for us to carry it around and worship it. So it's not necessarily the question of whether it's appropriate or not in, in a lot of cases for the reformers. It's the question of whether it was instituted for that means. Okay, yeah. Purpose. Now, um, a lot of Anglicans I've spoken to about this issue who do believe in transubstantiation, and I was, mm -hmm. I was quite surprised and shocked to find just how many Anglicans there are who do staunchly believe in transubstantiation. They say that the articles either aren't authoritative, so they don't have to believe them, or they say that the article is actually wrong um, in its argumentation, and therefore they can basically just ignore that part of it um yeah how would you respond to those two ideas yeah uh so the idea of the articles being authoritative or not that is that is a question that we need to have a discussion on and this would be this would take an entire episode to talk about yeah. i know uh francis j hall in his uh in his dogmatic theology will go over the relation of ecumenical authority versus the local providential authority that the uh, Book of Common Prayer and the articles have. But I, I, I do believe it's pretty clear. I, I, I don't think a good argument can be made from the specific language of the transformation of the bread and wine and the specific language in, I don't know if you want to look at this, but the black rubric. Yeah, of, yeah we'll get to that next. Of that we can't, we, we, we cannot believe in transubstantiation if we're going to have the supposition that the articles and the Book of Common Prayer are authoritative, it's mm -hmm. impossible. Well, I mean, you know, obviously it would take too long to unpack it all, but just in your opinion, then Anglicans do have to assent to the articles. Um, that's, or at least that's a should. That's a, that's a question that I'm, that I'm still working through, but I, I do believe at this point that they should. Okay. Yeah. Or at the very least, what I would say this at this juncture is that the articles, I mean, it's up to you if you believe them or not. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're not going to say you have to believe them, otherwise get out of church. But yeah. I think it is still fair enough for us to say that they define Anglican belief. So I've gotten some flack because in videos I've said things like, like the title of my video was Why Anglicans Reject Transubstantiation. Now, people like yourself have had some issues with some of the things I've said in the video. That's fine. But a lot of people have actually had a whole problem with the title of the video itself because they're saying Anglicans can believe whatever they want. You can't say that <laughs> Anglicans or Anglicanism has an opinion on this. And I'm my view is, well, no, the articles define Anglicanism. And so since the articles clearly reject transubstantiation, I think it is fair to say the Anglican Church and hence Anglicans yep. reject transubstantiation. It's kind of uh, a weird way of going about it to me because, I mean, you have Newman's Track 90, you have like all these resources from people in the Oxford movement who have explained uh, the, the 39 articles in a certain way where you shouldn't really have much of a problem with accepting them as long as you interpret it in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we could put their feet to the fire on this manner, because I don't even think uh, some of the Oxford movement, the Oxford movement uh, guys I've read on this issue, I haven't seen them accept transubstantiation in the sense of the, even the Roman scholastic way of explaining it. I've heard them say that it's just, they defined it in an inappropriate manner and they defined mm -hmm. it without ecumenical and Catholic consent. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know why there's, there's all these, these, I, I don't know. I don't even know where they're from, like Anglo Papalists or something. I don't even know they exist. Yeah, thought, it's usually Anglo Catholics. Yeah, I, I thought that was a uh, kind of like a Reformational Anglican boogeyman, the Anglo Papalist. But I don't know why they're coming on your videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then the next objection is that the article is actually wrong. Um, they would say that transubstantiation doesn't overthrow the nature of a sacrament, and therefore, because it's wrong, they their main obligation is to assent to the truth rather than what the articles say but you would happily defend the idea that transubstantiation does overthroweth the nature of a sacrament. 
I, I think that I think that is a good I think that is a good argument. I'm going to get the get into this a little more uh, mm-hmm. later when we go into a more general yeah. uh, view of why trans why I don't assent to transubstantiation. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's a good reason because yeah. I, I don't think you could say that the element of a sacrament is really the uh, accidental form or this accidental species. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that isn't that's just the appearances. Appearances can't be an element in the sacrament. Sure. Okay, so now moving aside from the articles then, um, while it is sort of popular for some Anglicans to reject the articles or not really care about them too much, as Anglicans, we we do obviously have to have a high level of respect for the Book of Common Prayer itself, especially the liturgy, the Eucharistic liturgy. And the question then is, does the Eucharistic liturgy leave no room for transubstantiation. Um, can you be assenting to the 1662 liturgy? Um, and if, if you believe in transubstantiation, are you sort of being contradictory um, is the question. So we'll get to the black rubric, which is a whole can of worms, really. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But, but first, I just want to ask you about one passage in the liturgy. It's what the priest says. He says, Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. So it's saying that we are receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine. Do you think that that leaves no room for transubstantiation because it would say that it's you're not receiving bread and wine. You're actually just receiving their accidents. It, or could now, you, now that, who do you be able to interpret that in a, in a transubstantiation way? If, if you really wanted to wrench it, I say you could interpret mm-hmm. it in a transubstantiation way, but I, I think that would be a, clearly a weird reading that that wouldn't be a normal reading of, of the passage. This, thy creatures of, of bread and wine. It's clearly attributing uh, the, the Eucharistic element to be bread and wine, not the mere accidental forms. Yeah, of, so certainly the intention of the writers was yeah, not. <laughs> the, uh, and I, I, I've said this to you before, but I definitely think that the prayer book and the articles have a, have a receptionist bent to it. They mm-hmm. definitely bent towards the Calvinistic view of the Eucharist, but also I don't think it absolutely discounts a substantial presence of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. But I do think it definitely goes against a substantial absence of the bread and wine. Sure, and yeah, that's, and that's the, why I talked about with um, James Gad um, as well, because he, he does believe in that idea, that more Luther view. All right, well, then we'll now we'll move into the black rubric. So, um, it's my understanding that in America, the Anglican Church never had the black rubric because um, you guys went with the Scottish prayer book. They didn't have it. Um, when it was added in 1662 in England, it wasn't subsequently added in the States. So a lot of Americans, such as James Gadd, actually, as well, say that they don't consider the black rubric to be part of the formularies. And so essentially, it's not an issue for them at all. Really? How do you respond to that? Because what I I think we've got a big problem there because now we're sort of splitting Anglicanism up too much and saying that American Anglicans and Commonwealth Anglicans are uh, believing different things. Um, yeah, that, so I that's, think that's, that's quite a problem. That's odd to me uh, because the black rubric was uh, because John Knox went against the practice of kneeling during the reception of the Eucharist. Yeah. So it was added into the prayer book in order to explain, okay, why do we kneel for the Eucharist? And how is it? It was this added in 1552. 15, yeah. The 1552 prayer book, and then also included in the 1662. So if if the American churchmen are going to say that the 1662 is not our authoritative liturgy, then really what is that? That seems a bit odd to me. That that isn't the sort of uh, the Catholic uh, understanding of Anglicanism. 
the yeah, well, the their act. argument is that the 1552 edition was unauthorized and illegal in an ecclesiastical sense because um, because Parliament put it in without any approval from um, bishops, and then it was it was removed in 1559, and they would say that the decision from the Elizabethan settlement to remove it is the most authoritative decision. When it was added again in 1662, but obviously edited. By that point, American Anglicanism was sort of its own its own beast. So they don't yeah. really care what the English got up to. But yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. I think Anglicanism needs to have unity. And I do still have the opinion that the Church of England is sort of our mothership, so to speak. And mm-hmm. um, maybe not quite anymore. I mean, things are different now. because uh, With Welby. Yeah, worldwide <laughs> Anglicanism is... Um, a, a bit of a mess. <laughs> yeah. Moment. Well, it's yeah. not really worldwide. It's kind of just Western. Yeah. So, but I, I would say that at the time of 1662, what the Church of England did is authoritative because they didn't even have the Anglican communion then anyway, in, in mm-hmm. the sense that we have it now. Yeah, we, we actually we weren't sort a of separate, autonomy. We weren't a separate country. We were under the crown. So I, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand why we, we wouldn't assent to the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, the Ordinal, the 39 Articles, mm-hmm. as are uh, as, as the authoritative. Yeah, and I mean of- um, Gafcon, which sort of represents the vast majority of conservative Anglicans, mm-hmm. says that the 1662 Prayer Book is the main formulary, or well, one of the main sort of formularies. So, I mean, even for conservative. Anglicans or people who are in the ACNA or REC or whatever, they would, I would, I would presume, would want to assent to what Gafcon said, which is that the 1662 prayer book is authoritative and that would include the black rubric. So, Is Father James in the ACNA? He's in the REC, but of, of course they're oh, in communion yeah. with the ACNA now. Yeah, Kind of like yeah. the denomination within the denomination. It's yeah, I cool think... Place. I'm not entirely sure about the politics of it. I think eventually, I think they were separate things and now they've like. Yeah, they helped. Bring. I'm in the ACNA. They helped start us when okay. the church went south. Well, yeah. it's been going south for a while when we finally jumped ship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's get into the black rubric then. So we both yep. agree it's a formulary. So um, I'll read it out. I'll read out the important part. So again, for those listening, it's it's explaining why we kneel. It's not something that is ever said out loud in the liturgy, but it is in addition to it describing what's going on. So it says, it is here declared that thereby no adoration is intended or ought to be done in kneeling, either unto the sacramental bread or wine there bodily received or unto any corporal presence of Christ's natural flesh and blood. And here's the important part. For the sacramental bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances and therefore may not be adored, for that would be idolatry, to be abhorred by all faithful Christians. And the natural body and blood of our Savior Christ are in heaven and not here. So, and then that gets this extra Calvinistic idea, of course, that he can't be in Mm -hmm. two places at once, but you've said that's not really so much an issue for transubstantiation. So the issue then would be, the statement that the sacramental bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances. Yeah, that that is that is definitely the uh, the knife to the that, that's the that's right to the jugular when it comes to whether an Anglican can believe in transubstantiation or not, whether that's in accords with our with with the formularies, because that that's just like you could you could explain away the corporeal presence because technically speaking. Uh, Roman Catholics don't believe in a corporeal presence. That's uh, mm-hmm. strictly Lutheran. Or you could say, well, technically, uh, there's only a substantial presence, but you cannot explain away the the sacramental bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances. It, it doesn't get clearer than that. It's it's as clear as that, that would be like saying, I'm a Catholic, but I don't believe in the Pope, or I'm Eastern Orthodox, and I don't believe in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. It's, it is possibly the clearest you could possibly get. Okay, sure. Um, so w- why is this important then 
for an Anglican. An Anglican could say, well, it doesn't really matter what I believe in my head about the Eucharist. Um, I'm, I'm turning out to an Anglican church. I'm doing this liturgy anyway. But what do you think it does affect our lifestyle, how we approach the Eucharist, or maybe it should? What would your argument about that be? Yeah, the, ma- the main effect is going to be whether it, it's, its first main effect is going to be whether we can have corporate reunion with Rome. Mm-hmm. Because this is, I know there was the meeting of the bishops a few years ago. I think it was, uh, what, 2009. I wrote an article on this, I should remember. But um, th- there was a meeting of the Roman Catholic and Anglican communions, which agreed on their Eucharistic doctrine in, in substance. But our articles still say this, and the Council of Trent still says that. Mm-hmm. And there, there's still not a reconciliation that can happen. And then second, it also has to do with the adoring of the elements, mm-hmm. whether when we when we have the uh, the host on our hands and we consume the host, are we consuming uh, sacramental bread or are we consuming the appearance of bread, the species of bread with the uh, with the true substance? Mm-hmm of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. Because if we have the substance of Christ's body with concomitantly the blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, everybody should agree that we should bow down and do reverence. Mm -hmm. But if it is sacramental bread with the substance of Christ united to the substance of the bread, then we can't adore bread. Yeah. And that's, right. that's the debate that practically speaking, which is going to happen. And if you believe in transubstantiation, is it a problem if you don't adore the, the, the bread and wine? Because you're um, essentially I, you're not giving to Christ what is his due in that case. What, when, when I look to, uh, because plenty are going to make the argument that the Eastern Orthodox Church agrees with the Roman Catholic Church on transubstantiation. I know that a lot of uh, Anglican writers I've read disagree with that mm-hmm. uh, pretty intensely. And I know plenty of Eastern Orthodox disagree with that pretty intensely. But you can't get around the fact that the Eastern Catholic Church does not practice Eucharistic adoration. That's not a liturgical practice that they receive. And it isn't a universal practice, which has been done everywhere and by all. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I mean, this isn't the topic of the video, but just to just to talk about that, I, I've been to a Greek Orthodox uh, service many times because there's one down the road from where I live and, and there's been times I've popped in and they, they have the elements in, in like a, I don't know, they'll obviously have a name for it, but it's, it's like a box um, and they, they pass it down the aisle and whenever it walks past anyone, they actually fall to their knees and, and cross themselves. Um, so that, that definitely seems like Eucharistic ador- adoration to me, but is that, is that a Western right church or is it Eastern right? Nah, that's, that's Eastern. I mean, the whole liturgy is huh. in Greek. Um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, formal Eucharistic adoration, I guess might be practiced by some, but it isn't a universal practice okay. so far as I know. I've, yeah. I've heard it yeah. from multiple people, but I guess certain, uh, Catholicly, uh, influenced uh, parishes might mm-hmm. or maybe that's not formal Eucharistic adoration is kneeling to the mm-hmm. sacrament of bread and wine sure okay so well that's the formularies then I think we, we're in agreement that a faithful Anglican to the formularies can't believe in transubstantiation yeah um, what level of <laughs> When we're talking about a Christian belief that we think is wrong, there's obviously differences. There's something that could just be a little bit wrong. Like, oh, I think that Jesus had black hair and you think he had dark brown yeah. hair. But then there's levels of wrong, like Arianism, where Jesus is, you know, not the same substance as the Father, um, which is um, heresy to the degree where your salvation is completely in jeopardy. Where is transubstantiation on the spectrum for you, do you think? Is it, is it something, I mean, you think it's wrong, but do you think it's this major, major problem, or are you happy to shake hands with Roman Catholic and say, we're brothers in Christ, 
Yeah, if if it was if it was the Roman communion and the Anglican communion, and we agreed on everything besides transubstantiation, I I wouldn't mind having communion. I don't think that it is a church dividing issue. Sure, honestly. Yeah. Cool. I, I agree with you. I think what matters is that we think Christ is there. Um, so, yeah. okay. It depends like how you define. I, what I do think is a church dividing issue is if one of those communions anathematizes any other view of Christ's mode of presence. That is a church dividing issue. Right. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into then for the final part of our video, essentially why you think transubstantiation is wrong on a more philosophical level. We've looked at what the formularies say. Um, this is more so you giving your take on it. Yeah. Before before we do that, can we, uh, can we sort of go back a little bit and uh, kind of hammer back on the uh, the the objectors to the articles who try to interpret it to say that we can believe in transubstantiation. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I have a few. I have a few more comments to make on that. Right. Because um, because the way that they're going to interpret it is they're going to say that the word transubstantiation can be used in four senses. Mm -hmm. So they're going to say, in one sense, it's the crude doctrine of the laity and some of the uh, Roman apologists, the materialistic sort of interpretation of transubstantiation. And they're going to say that's the way in which the articles are condemning. But there's also the philosophical, scholastic way of Thomas describing it, which the articles aren't hitting that. They're only hitting the first. And the issue with saying they're not hitting the second, but they're only hitting the first is, yes, the direct reference of the articles is clearly to the first. But also the statements that they make against the first saying, hey, you can't believe in the materialistic sort of way of doing it because you're having the substance of the bread and wine not there. Mm -hmm. That defense also goes against the second view. So even though they might not have had the scholastic view in mind, and I don't think they had the scholastic Thomistic view, even though many of them knew the scholastic Thomistic view, they read Thomas, they read the Summa. But I think it still goes against the second view, the scholastic view, even though it's just trying to go against the, the mm -hmm. more uh, lay view of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we can speak, uh, and I might get in trouble for this, but we, we can speak of a transubstantiating happening. Transubstantiation mm -hmm. isn't an, an ugly term in and of itself. The Romish doctrine of transubstantiation, which is expressed by Thomas Aquinas and is rebuked in the articles, that we must disagree with as we've already went over. But the term transubstantiation itself as to say that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist and there's a change that happens at the consecration by which something goes from being normal bread and normal wine to sacramental mm -hmm. bread and sacramental wine using transubstantiation in that sense isn't exactly a problem. So it can be used in an orthodox sense, but I say it's it's unwise to use it in that sense because it comes along with all that scholastic baggage. Yeah, doing. yeah. I mean, obviously there's a change, but I think that change is more of an exaltation. So what was once just bread is now more than just bread. It's now sacramental bread. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Is there any other comments you wanted to make before we get into your philosophical critique? Yeah, that's um, that. That's the only, really, really the only other comment I had. I okay. think we went pretty through the fact that Anglicans cannot affirm the authority of the Third Union Articles and affirm transubstantiation. Sure. Okay, so why why do you think, as a theologian, that transubstantiation is wrong? beyond what the formularies are talking about. Okay, so first, what needs to be said, uh, as Lancelot Andrew says against Robert Bellarmine, is we, Roman Catholics and Anglicans, do not disagree on the fact that Christ is present in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Because the root of so many of these issues, especially when it comes to Anglicans, which affirm transubstantiation, is they look in the Book of Common Prayer, they see we eat, Christ's flesh and drink his blood. And they say, oh, that must be transubstantiation. That's the only rational, logical conclusion they have. It's either Zwinglianism 
or transubstantiation. There's nothing in the middle of those two. Yeah. Those are our only options. And that's obviously a false dichotomy. Mm-hmm. So to get that out of the way first, we both believe in Christ's presence. The question is the mode of Christ's presence. Mm-hmm. And historically, the debate is over the presence of the substance of the bread and wine. That is what we need to get through first. And if we can show that the bread and wine are substantially present, then the then trans, transubstantiation is false. Sure. And that is what was done. People weren't burned alive for saying that Christ wasn't present. Nobody was really saying that. Even Zwingli, there's debate over whether he said that. People were burned alive for saying that the bread was present. Do you have an issue with the idea of substance and accidents in itself as well? Or is that something no. that you, you think is okay? I'm a, when, when, when it comes to my metaphysics, when it comes to my philosophy, I'm, I'm Thomistic, I'm Aristotelian. Okay. I, uh, if you've ever heard of the Davenant Institute, that's where, that's where I study. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and their thing is if we go back to, uh, such as Zanke, uh, Vermigli, Turretin, uh, Petrus von Maastricht, if you go back to these reformed scholastics, what they did is they took the, the metaphysics, the philosophy of Aristotle. They accepted the, the thought of Thomas Aquinas on these issues. And it's part of uh, our Protestant blood to uh, to accept the Aristotelian metaphysics because yeah, that is yeah. true and good philosophy. I, I don't I don't have an opinion on it about whether or not it's true. But in my video, I, I said that transubstantiation requires it to be true, and to say that you must believe in it, as the Roman Catholic Church does, is to say that you must accept this um, Aristotelian metaphysic. Yep. And, I, and that's why I said I don't think that that's um, justifiable to say you must believe in something that can't be proven from Holy Writ because Scripture never says, well, there's substance and accidents. And yeah, so but I, I think we might run into a little bit of a problem there because mm-hmm. we also affirm, uh, I believe the articles affirm such ideas as divine simplicity in our, in our doctrine of God, which requires certain philosophical uh, preconceptions. And also when it comes to affirmations such as the Trinity, when it comes to what is a hypostasis, what is a persona, what is uh, what what are all these ideas? And uh, you you need to have a metaphysics which isn't necessarily derived from Scripture, though it isn't contrary to Scripture, in order to lay these ideas out and not just talk past each other in biblicist terms. I quote this verse at you, you quote this verse at me, and we just throw it back and forth at each other and slam our Mm -hmm. fist. Mm-hmm. on the desk like luther did and just said this is my body this is my body this yeah is my i body. think i think though when we get to the doctrines of god that's that does have weight behind it because of the ecumenical councils and mm-hmm. creeds um but since no council spoke on transubstantiation um, yeah the fourth lateran is uh is where you'll get it spoken of first if i remember correctly off the top mm-hmm. of my head but that was a western council in uh what is it 12 15 12 15 i believe was mm-hmm. So somewhere around the 13th century. So it wasn't of the undivided church, but I, I still think it's wise because, for example, when uh, when Father James and I talk about, okay, what, what do you believe? What do I believe? When I talk with, let's say, a Lutheran, or I talk with even a Roman Catholic, and we explain our views of, you, of, of the Eucharist, we if we don't use philosophical language, if we don't use the metaphysics of Aristotle, what's going to happen is we're all going to sound like we're saying the exact same thing. And even with your view, uh, it, it can sound like you and Zwingli are saying the exact same thing if you don't throw a little metaphysics in there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, that's fair enough. Well, anyway, yeah, let's get into it then. So your critique and is to do with bread and wine and what's happening okay. with that. So... The what, what we need to do is we can't grant uh, presuppositionally that the bread isn't present. Mm-hmm. We have to force our uh, Roman Catholic brothers and sisters into proving to us that the substance of the bread and wine are absent because explicitly scripture never talks about the absence of the bread and wine. It just talks about the presence of Christ. Yeah. They would have to prove that by good and necessary consequence or argue that's implicit. They can't say that it's explicitly spoken of. 
So that needs to be proved. And there are certain facts in the data of scripture we have that would seemingly contradict the idea that the substance of the bread and wine are not present because mm-hmm. they're transformed. So first, uh, scripture calls the sacrament bread. Yeah. It's first Corinthians 10, 16. Yeah. Yep. In first Corinthians 10, 16, it says that bread we break, that wine. And uh, also you'll get... Um, You'll, you'll get some thinkers like uh, I read uh, John Wycliffe and his arguments against the Eucharist. They'll say even the word this, this is my body. Oh, well, this what? This mm-hmm. bread mm-hmm. is my body. And I, I'm, I'm, the jury's still out over whether I think that's, that convincingly goes against uh, Roman Catholic doctrine or not, but it, it's still... It's yeah, and then there's it. after the consecration, Christ says, I, w- I will never again drink of this fruit, this fruit of the vine mm-hmm. until I drink it with you in the Father's kingdom. So he's clearly referring to what they've just drunk as the fruit of the vine. Yeah. Which yeah. means that that's, it must, yeah. the plainest reading is to have uh, that identification refer to whatever is in his hand, the host, as having the substance of bread. But a a Roman Catholic will argue, they'll say, hey, look, I have the accidents of bread. I have the appearances, the physical nature of bread. Therefore, of course, how are they going to describe it? They're going to describe it as bread. Mm -hmm. But they've kind of shot themselves in the foot here. Because in their argument, one of these scholastics, number one arguments for why the substance of bread can't be there must be transformed into the body is because this is my body is is used is must be an identification of substance Mm. well is must be an identification of substance this bread we break must also be an identification of substance so they've kind of given themselves enough rope to hang themselves on this issue right do you you, you get what i'm do you get what i'm getting at yeah yeah um yeah so do you think John six can be used here? Because uh, it, the the main comment I got from scripture to my video was, "Oh, so you don't believe in John six then?" And people just kept on quoting John's passages <laughs> from John six to me, and it's like, I, it, what's so funny about it is I've actually spent hours and hours and hours of my life at seminary arguing with Protestants about how John 6 is about the Eucharist. And now people are saying that I must not believe in, in John 6 being about the Eucharist. Um, so of course the classic one is my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. And there's no mention of bread and wine there, but I, I just don't even think you can use that. Yeah, That's, that's interesting because um, if you read uh, Luther on the Babylonian captivity of the church, Luther is going to argue that we cannot use John 6 in our Eucharistic debates because it's not about the sacrament. But if you go to Peter Martyr Vermigli, who mm-hmm. has a substantially lower view of the sacrament than Martin Luther does, because Martin Luther honestly probably has the highest view of the sacrament in anybody because he believes in a corporeal presence mm. when uh, Roman Catholics uh, and Anglicans do not believe in that. So Peter Martyr Vermigli is going to go to John 6 and say, what else can John 6 be about than about the sacrament? Everybody agrees on that. So, so it's kind of weird because on both sides of this issue, you have people debating whether John 6 is about the sacrament or not. And it doesn't definitively lay us on either camp mm. because this, this is my, my, blood is true drink, my body is true food. That doesn't necessarily say the substance of the bread is present or not. That just says that the substance, well, that Christ's flesh and blood are truly eaten and drank. And yeah, but I, I've heard people say that the only way you can be truly physically eating, you can, you can be saying um, that you're eating his flesh is in a transubstantiation or a Lutheran view. Because um, my view has been critiqued that you're not, you can't possibly be eating Christ's body in my view, but that's a whole other story. Every, everybody's, everybody's going to have to say from the reality that we see bread and wine, that there's at least the accidents of bread and wine. Everybody is going to have to nuance it in mm-hmm. a certain way in which we're going to explain the mode by which we receive Christ. Mm-hmm. And no, nobody, nobody's going to have a pure, okay, 
uh, the consecration happens that a hunk of flesh drops mm-hmm. down on the pattern. Nobody has that. And if you, if you, if that did happen, and if you did have that view, you could say, I am the pure one. I am the only true one who, who can say that Christ is truly present because I believe a hunk of flesh appears on the patent during the consecration. Yeah. So I, I think that's a, a bit of a lame argument. Sure. Because, because everybody's going to have to, everybody has to nuance it in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we can't just be extremely hyper literalistic. Sure. Okay. So second, uh, the bread is necessary because of the nature of the sacrament. We kind of already went over that, but because we need, uh, in the Augustinian view, I believe he talks about this, uh, in his, in his, De Doctrina Christiana or his tractates on John, I can't remember which, mm-hmm. uh, but he talks about how the na- to have the nature of a sacrament, you have that inward spiritual grace, and you also have that outward element. Mm-hmm. Now, in the, uh, in the Roman Catholic view, in transubstantiation, the substance of the element is destroyed. So the question is, can it be a true element or not? And that's, that's a live question of, uh, I haven't really been, I'm not extremely convinced one way or the other, but that still is something which needs to be considered is the fact that the element in your Eucharist in, in this sacrament isn't even substantially present. It's just an appearance of an element. Yeah. Did, wait, did you, did you, I, I'm not sure if I misunderstood. You said that the substance is destroyed just then. Oh, I, I, that, that was just a manner of speaking. The substance oh, okay. <laughs> of the substance of the bread isn't there. It isn't sure, yeah. <laughs> the subs- yeah, I know. I, yeah. I understand now how uh, how you get you get mixed up in your words. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, cool. So that's that one. Um, let's let's just 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 list them out. Okay, yeah. Then the third one is uh, the bread is necessary for the inherence of the accidents. The, the inher- yeah, the inherence of the accidents. So remember, I talked about how actually the appearances aren't even the appearances of anything. They're just accidental forms, which mm-hmm. are, uh, which are floating. And it, and the substance of Christ's body and blood aren't attached. The, the appearances don't adhere in, or that would be obviously impious to say mm-hmm. that the, the substance of God has taken on the appearances of bread and wine. That'd be a pretty crazy thing to say is that God could mold, for example, yeah, like God sure. could, be, could be eaten. So it's really yeah. that the substance is underneath and hidden by that. But to say that you have an accident, which is not inhering in anything is a bit of an odd statement to make. And mm-hmm. that goes against normally how metaphysics works. And you could say, I, I, I haven't been convinced that it's metaphysically impossible. I'm saying it's metaphysically improbable because what you have to do here is you have to multiply miracles. You mm-hmm. have to say, okay, I have, every time I have a, a semen contradiction or an issue where I'm going to attribute it to isn't anything natural. I'm just going to attribute it to another miracle. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on and on. And you, and mm-hmm. you see it through the, uh, the complete Eucharistic system yeah. is it, because you run into these metaphysical problems, such as the inherence of the accidents, you're gonna have another miracle, which is piled upon the other miracles. Sure. Okay. Now I have I have three uh, three arguments because Thomas does positively argue that there cannot be the substance of bread and wine. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go over so uh, the listeners are gonna know what to expect from the best of the best. Okay. From from the the angelic doctor, the common doctor, the doctor of transubstantiation, the one which Trent looked back to. <laughs> So, so first, uh, he argues that a substantial change is necessary for a substantial presence to occur. So you can't have the substance of bread and wine. We can't have the substance of body and blood without the substance of bread and wine changing. He says that you have, remember, local presence and substantial presence, local change and substantial change. So in order for something to get here, you either can have it locally move or you can have it appear as a substance. Mm -hmm. They say those are the only two options. And and they say Christ obviously doesn't locally move. That would be against our Christology. So what you need is you need to have the substance of the bread and wine to change in order for anything to appear there. 
Yeah. And then that's, you, you understand kind of where they're getting at. Mm-hmm. So uh, my response to that is that you, you don't necessarily need to have the absence of one substance in order for another substance to take its place. You can have a union of two substances mm-hmm. because substance isn't like a dimensive quality. A, it isn't a dimensive quantity. It isn't just like a thing where we could, uh, where, where it's like an area that it takes up. There can obviously yeah. be a union between, between two substances. Mm-hmm. It, is, it, isn't, it isn't like, well, this space is being taken up by the substance of Christ's body and blood, so we can't have more space being taken up by the substance of bread and wine. It, there, that idea is, is anathema. That's an accident. Right, yeah, so, yeah. So it, it doesn't really make sense to me, and you could have a union of two substances. Sure. Okay. Okay, now, now second, he argues that it is necessary for the host to be identified with Christ's body. So he's, if he said he said that if you have the substance of the bread and the wine and the substance of the body and blood, as I would say, and as certain Lutherans would argue, as Friar, uh, Father James would argue, he said, you wouldn't say this is my body. You would say, here is my body. Because it would also be bread. And I, I think this is honestly a very poor argument from, from St. Thomas Aquinas with all due respect. He's usually a very sharp thinker, but the reason that it's such a poor argument is because we have the communicatio idiomatum. We say that Christ right there is God, and that Christ right there is man. And there's no contradiction. We don't say, here is man, because there's an inhypostatization of the human nature in, in the divinity. Mm. We say, this is God, and this is man. And we're able to describe the single subject in both ways. Mm. In the same way, like you get Saint Saint, uh, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, the way that he describes the Eucharist is based on his Christology. So I, it's just reasonable to describe it, be able to describe it as both to have a bit of a communicatio idiomatum going on mm-hmm. there. And now third, these these are these are two arguments that I'm going to put together. He argues that Eucharistic adoration. That we cannot have Eucharistic adoration if there is the substance of the bread and wine. And since we have Eucharistic adoration, therefore, the substance of the bread and wine can't be there. And second, from food laws of medieval uh, Roman Catholicism, that you what, what they would have is they would have multiple masses going on. The same priest would celebrate multiple times in the same day. So therefore, since that, that priest is celebrating once and receiving the host multiple times within the same day, you couldn't have the substance of bread and wine be there because then you would break the Eucharistic fast. If uh, from people in higher church traditions that recognize the Eucharistic fast, they say the Eucharistic fast would be broken by receiving the substance of bread and wine. This is like, but it doesn't get yeah. broken by receiving the accidents. This is a and, common thing we see with Rome. Um, it's like It's like when the Pope said, we know that Anglican orders are invalid because we always... Well, of course, they didn't always, but we always reordained Anglican priests. Um, and it's like <laughs> it, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, or you could be wrong. <laughs> have, have you ever? Uh, did you read my article on that uh, on that topic? I did. Yeah, defending Anglican holy orders. That that was that was a fun one to to yeah. write because that that just kind of shows uh, because you hear about like Rome sometimes falling into like weird arguments and bad arguments. Mm-hmm. And that really is a shining example is their rejection of Anglican holy orders. It has no reasonable foundation no. In, uh, in theology or in history. Mm-hmm. So yeah, th- this, this is a, this is a popular sort of way of arguing in the, in the middle ages, like uh, St. Thomas, he'll argue against female priests mm-hmm. and the way he'll argue against female priests isn't a, well, he does point to first Timothy two twelve, the consensus of the fathers, the councils, he does point to those things. But in his explanation section, he says the reason is because the tonsure, the tonsure is where they would shave the middle of the head. And in first Corinthians, it says it is a shame for women to shave their heads. And since we have the tonsure, that makes it as stuff like it's the the experience here because we have the tonsure and women can't shave their heads. Therefore, women can't be priests. 
So I, th- I think that's going to be my next my next blog post. I think I'm going to argue against female priests in the ACNA based on tonsure. I, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's funny. I, I think that's about. I think that's about all I have for you. Do you have any okay. uh, other questions? Yeah, I've got two questions for you. So um, my first one is. Um, Eucharistic miracles in the sense of the, the um, wafer actually bleeding human blood and, you, you know, it's, it's definitely human DNA and, and, and the accidents yeah. of, of Christ's body and blood actually start to appear is something that's accepted by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, obviously, that, that on a popular level, there'll be stuff that maybe Vatican hasn't sort of formally approved, but there's definitely been cases where the Roman Catholic Church as an institution is saying this happened. Um, that for me, that is weird, you know. Like, yeah, it is for starters. I don't believe in it, but it sort of undermines the whole foundation of transubstantiation for me. Um, uh, of, now they're saying that Christ actually is physically present, like, yeah, obviously. That, so, uh, that uh, so, so yeah, the you, Eucharistic miracles, uh, that uh, that that is a very long standing tradition mm-hmm. if you read uh for example um red birdus mm-hmm. red birdus an eighth century theologian i remember reading in him where he'll talk about how there was a jewish man this this is the stories they used to tell in their theology books there was a jewish man who came to the cathedral one day the local cathedral mm-hmm. and he said that i'm gonna go and receive the eucharist i'm gonna keep it in my tongue and i'm gonna spit it out on the ground and what happens is when the Eucharist hits his tongue, it just like blows up and starts flaming in his mouth and starts causing intense pain. He starts choking and he almost dies. And then the priest, uh, like, I think, I, I forget how it ends. I think the priest like baptizes him. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm never going to do this again. And then also in St. Thomas Aquinas, in his, uh, in his articles in Tertia Pars on the uh, on transubstantiation on the Eucharist, he'll talk about how to some people the Eucharist has appeared as a baby and the Eucharist has appeared uh, in, in other different forms. And he asked the question of, I think he analyzes this scholastically. I, I can't re- recall what he says on this, but this is a pretty longstanding tradition within the, both the church Catholic because Rad Burtis is writing in a pretty early date mm-hmm. and in uh, and in medieval scholastic Western theology is that you have the tradition of Eucharistic miracles. So what so, would Aquinas, how would Aquinas respond to this? Because it sort of seems like he's making this elaborate argument for how it all works. And then all of a sudden, no, 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 Christ can be physically present. And doesn't that so, <laughs> undermine kind of the whole foundation? And now we, we're back to this whole extra Calvinistic problem all over again, because, yep. Yeah, Christ is now physically that, that, there. That is that is a uh, that is a very that is a very good point right there. I am um, I'm actually just not really sure what he says. I mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever read that, or I don't think I've taken the time out of out of my day to read the article on whether Christ is locally present when he appears as a baby. Like I, that wasn't something that I've done before. But now <laughs> yeah. that now that you're asking me, I might actually go back and uh, and check out what he says. Yeah, because, because, I mean, you've said that transubstantiation doesn't violate the extra Calvinisticum, and that, that's the case, sure. But if the, if the Roman Catholic Church is saying that Eucharistic miracles of this nature can happen, then that means they can't believe in the extra Calvinisticum. I, I, w- I would say that, um, that what Aquinas would say and what uh, any smart Roman Catholic would say, if I was a Roman Catholic and I was defending Eucharistic miracles, I would say that it was a theophany. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's what I would that's what I would put it at, or that it was uh, it was certain cases of a miraculous generation of uh, certain accidental qualities of Christ, mm-hmm. which doesn't uh, violate Orthodox Christology, uh, just in the same way as uh, such as when you have the multiplication of the bread. The multiplication of the bread doesn't uh, say that the bread has the quality yeah. of ubiquity. Yeah, but it's, it's a problem though because they believe that he's present in his soul and divinity. So yeah. If so he's present this, this is just the it's just yeah. that's kind of a weird question. Um I don't really know what I think yeah. about uh Eucharistic miracles because a lot of them seem pretty pretty 
well documented. It's kind of cool. Uh, I, th- I think I need to think through the theology of them a lot more. But this mm-hmm. also doesn't prove trans- transubstantiation mm-hmm. because this doesn't prove that the accidents of being the substance of bread and wine are absent. Sure. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't prove that. Therefore, it could, it, honestly, it could be the Zwinglian view and Christ is just appearing. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, this doesn't prove the Roman Catholic view. So if somebody's going to point at you and say Eucharistic miracles, I've had people do that to me before because I don't believe in transubstantiation yet. Or at, I guess yet, yeah, if if I get convinced. But um, <laughs> if <laughs> I've had people use that as a clobber against me before, and I've said, well, this doesn't really prove anything about the nature of the sacrament at all. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, my final question then is about Eucharistic sacrifice. So as Anglicans, we do believe in Eucharistic sacrifice. Yes. Um, the liturgy says that um, accept this um, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And then it says that in the Eucharist, we offer ourselves to be a lively sacrifice unto thee. Um, so how does transubstantiation change how you would understand a Eucharistic sacrifice? Does it change anything? Because the there's in the articles, it is the idea that Christ is re-sacrifice is obviously rejected. Now, there's a popular level argument against a popular level view of transubstantiation that in transubstantiation, they are re-sacrificing Christ. Do you think that that doesn't hold up when we get to the more scholastic view or, or is it still the case? When you when you look at certain authors like uh, Zanke and Vermigli, who are exceedingly Thomistic, and they uh, help lay the lay the foundations for the Anglican Church, they draw uh, explicitly from from Thomas Aquinas when it comes to how we're going to describe uh, the Eucharistic sacrifice, because our Anglican fathers rightly realized in the early liturgies of the Church, and in uh, the early interpretations of Malachi what is it, Malachi 3 something, when it comes to uh, incense will be offered. Yeah, yeah. Places. Um, I've got an article that mentions all that. Yeah, Old Testament yeah, yeah. prophecies there's, there's, of the sacrifice in the church. Yeah, so you'll you'll get uh, you'll get St. Justin Martyr interpreting it in that way and almost mm-hmm. all of the Eucharistic liturgies interpreting it in that way. You get a lot of fathers using the language of the blood of the sacrifice. So our fathers rightly recognize that we need to use the word sacrifice in some sense. Now, the Tridentine doctrine of the sacrifice is, uh, is regarded by most Protestant theologians today and by Protestant theologians back then as to be in contradiction to the, uh, the sort of participatory way that we have it now mm-hmm. of a, represent, a, a, a representation and a participation, uh, a sacramental participation in the sacrifice of Christ, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, a sacrificing of ourselves, and a mm-hmm. memorial sacrifice. Those, I think that's the fourfold sense that Zanke uses. So they, they would call it a real and propitiatory sacrifice in, in the Trinity way. And, uh, and when Bishop Cozen uh, writes, against, uh, writes against Rome, he says that to describe it as a real and propitiatory sacrifice is, is wrong. Mm-hmm. Now, I haven't, I haven't been sold either way, and I need to do a lot more research on this, whether the Trinity uh, doctrine of the Eucharistic sacrifice is identified with uh, the popular level uh, interpretation of it, or if Rome has stayed consistent. Because when you meet Roman Roman apologists today, what they're going to say is they're going to say basically what we're saying, and uh, that that's a good thing for us, is because either they've moved closer to us and now we can have more substantial agreement, or they've always been like us and we've just kind of had a misunderstanding of one another. Mm-hmm. But uh, but Today, there, there's a significant agreement on, on the Eucharistic sure. sacrifice. And, and transubstantiation itself wouldn't change this either way? I, I, don't, I don't think it would change it either way. I, okay. I don't think a substantial presence would, would change it either way. Because, I mean, if, uh, if you look at other bodies which believe in the substantial presence, such as the Lutherans, that, that wouldn't change uh, either to be more or less friendly their, their doctrine of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Yeah, I, I think the Luther view would have more of a problem because when the priest is actually snapping the wafer, he would be yeah, snapping it, Christ in half. Before snap, which happens. Yeah, so that would be a problem. Um, okay, well, I think that that's all the questions I had for you. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to your presentation? Uh, yeah, I think that I think we had a pretty thorough sort of uh, a, a thorough 
interview of of everything about transubstantiation. Yeah, great. This was great. I really did enjoy this. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your extensive knowledge and wisdom with us for that. So um, before you go, just where can we find you on social media? Just have some time to show what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you could you could go on my blog, www.apologiaanbukanda.com. And that's linked you look, in the description below, by the way. Oh, thank you. And if you look at the top right of there, you see the little the little buttons you can click where it's the little icons and you see we have a YouTube page, we have an Instagram, we have a Facebook, and we have a Twitter. And I'm pretty active on Twitter. You'll see all my snarky comments and uh, retweets and stuff like that on Twitter. I kind of use it more as a personal page than officially apology on the kind of stuff, but, it, but it's always theologically based. Cool. Okay. And it's always based too. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, let's just close in prayer maybe, and then we'll head off. Um, we'll just, we'll just say a prayer show. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll pray for us. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that despite the fact that we live in completely different countries, Christian and I were able to have a conversation today and, and that it could be viewed by other people. So we thank you that technology has allowed that to happen. And we just ask, Father, that you will ensure that we can, as a church, as the Anglican Church, come to greater agreement with each other about the Eucharist and what we believe about it and how we practice it in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Okay, thank you very much, and God bless everything you're doing, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Yeah, we'll cool. definitely have to do this again. Definitely. All right, see you, man. See you.